Hello friends, I am Dr. Shonali Chandra and I welcome you all to my YouTube channel which is Medicine Decoded. Now as a part of case scenario based series for obstetrics and gynecology, what I have chosen for you people to discuss today is bleeding in early pregnancy. Now this is a very common clinical scenario that we often find ourselves in clinical situations and also very very important for your examinations as well. So let's get going and consider this particular clinical situation. Now there is a primary gravida who's been married for six months and she comes with the complaint of uh, pain and and also followed by you know a bleeding per vaginum for six hours and she is having two and a half months period of amenorrhea now what are the differential diagnosis that we are going to consider in this situation now at the top of our head what does come to our mind is miscarriage abortion of course a uh, molar pregnancy it could be a molar pregnancy which could present with the first trimester bleeding it could be an ectopic pregnancy which usually presents with pain most of the times first followed by yes maybe uh, you know a little bit amount of vaginal bleeding as well uh, it could be a coincidental gynecological cause i mean she could be pregnant with a gynecological cause of bleeding or you know she could not be pregnant at all and present with uh, a gynecological cause similarly it could be a coincidental a traumatic cause as well now at the offset you can also clearly understand here that these two causes whether it's a gynecological cause or a traumatic cause you could simply eliminate by taking a careful history history pertaining uh, to any trauma history pertaining to a prior similar complaint history pertaining to the prior menstrual cycles what her pattern has been and so forth and for the above three differential diagnoses, you can obviously go ahead and check for pregnancy by doing a simple urine based you know urine pregnancy test or a serum beta hcg now what i would like to emphasize here is that whenever a woman with reproductive age group you know comes with a complaint of vaginal bleeding the first thing that should come to your mind is could it be a pregnancy related complication now you would want to know whether she has had a period of amenorrhea i mean this episode of bleeding has it happened after a period of amenorrhea right even if it is not like that then also any reproductive age group woman comes with the complaint of vaginal bleeding start off by ruling out pregnancy associated causes check for pregnancy first right now when you have done that after that you should be moving on ahead with your history now what are the important points to note in the history First of all, the date of NFP, the last menstrual period, whether her cycles have been regular in the past or not. For the plain and simple reason that you need to calculate, if at all she is pregnant, you need to calculate the period of gestation in weeks because your size of uterus, your further differential diagnosis, they will all rely on the period of gestation in weeks. Then note the character and the amount of bleeding, right? I mean, what was it uh, after a traumatic episode that bleeding happened? Was it all of a sudden that it developed, right? Uh, is it associated with any pain? Uh, how much is the bleeding? I mean, how many pads has she soaked? I mean, does she also pass clots along with the bleeding? So that would give you an idea about uh, the amount of blood she has lost already. Now, association with pain and character of pain, right? So, if it's a continuous uh, pain, where is it located? I mean, you know, there could be a pregnant woman with complaint of pain, abdomen, and abdomen is a very wide area. I mean, the pain has to be localized in the lower abdomen, right? And particularly if it's an ectopic pregnancy, you see the pain would likely be localized to one side, you know, it would be in the iliac fossa, maybe on the left side or the right side, depending upon which side of the tubal ectopic it is. So, note the character of pain note the association of bleeding with pain and also the site and location of the pain associated symptoms of fever I mean why do I want to know about fever since I'm considering the possibility of miscarriage and abortion you see I want to know whether uh, there is some element of infection which is already there right so I would like to ask it at the offset maybe she probably has had uh, you know, uh, taken uh, a medical opinion elsewhere, she probably has had an instrumental elsewhere. I mean, you know, if you do not ask these points in the first go itself, then during the course of the history taking, these points, they get simply lost. So, do ask about the symptom of fever as well. Any history of drug intake? 
I mean, there is a possibility, you know, sometimes women are not aware that they are pregnant and, you know, they might have taken some prescription medication, right? Or very importantly, sometimes there is a history of abortive patient intake as well. So do ask about the history of any drug intake, history of any prior intervention. Like I told you, she might have had a surgical intervention done elsewhere, outside in some other setup you need to know. And any history of prior illness, uh, what I want to particularly ask about, see, in any medical case, history of prior illnesses become important because, you know, you need to consider whether those illness, uh, illnesses need to be treated alongside. And in particular, our case, it becomes important because it could lead to a pointer towards the cause of the uh, process of miscarriage or abortion. So maybe she is a known case of maybe a polycystic ovarian syndrome or she could be a known case of diabetes mellitus or any of these and number of things or a genital tuberculosis. So it is important to note the uh, you know history of any prior illness along with this as well. Now let's say what we found uh, in our particular case. Now she's a primary gravida. When I calculated the period of gestation, she came out to be 10 weeks. Uh, we did a urine pregnancy test, which was positive. And uh, bleeding started about six hours ago, and that was followed by cramping lower abdominal pain. And that increased in severity as the bleeding uh, progressed. She soaked two pads over the last six hours. Now that is significant. See, the number of soakage of pads is only going to give you an idea about the amount of blood she has already lost. And she's also giving history of passage of clots. Now, once you've taken this basic history, we need to look at the points in examination. So obviously, when a person is coming with bleeding, you know, you do need to check the vitals. You need to check the pulse rate, you need to check the blood pressure, you need to check uh, the respiratory rate. So you need to see if she's hemodynamically unstable or not. So somebody who's coming to the casualty, I mean, you know, somebody who's had an emergency and has come, these vitals are very, very important in assessing the hemodynamic status. Also look for the clinical evidence of pallor. Now, moving on further, you know, you need to check the temperature as well. I mean, do not skip this part. Do not skip the basics of a medical examination. I mean, you've talked about the history of fever, talked about the significance that it holds in our case. Uh, it could be, a, you know, a, a septic abortion. It could be, a, you know, underlying uh, infection of uterine contents. So you need to need, you know, note that and also check the temperature. Then after that, we focus on the abdominal exam. Right. So somebody who's having a process of miscarriage is abortion, you see, uh, the abdomen would definitely be soft. Right. I mean, there's rigidity in the abdomen or if there is generalized abdominal tenderness, then you start thinking in terms of the possibility of maybe a hemoperitoneum. And then, then you start thinking about the possibility of a ruptured ectopic. So you think along different lines. But when it is a plain and simple abortion, you see, or a miscarriage, then there is going to be a soft uh, abdomen. Right. There's no going to be distension of the abdomen. And at the most, there is going to be, you know, some uh, you know, lower abdominal uh, tenderness on deep palpation. And then, of course, the pelvic examination needs to be done. You need to check the size of the uterus. You need to check for the uh, furnaces if there is uh, an, uh, you know, any furnishal tenderness or any indexal mass that you can make out. And of course, while you are doing this pelvic examination, do not skip on looking at the cervix. Do perform a per speculum examination first because, again, if it's a coincidental gynecological cause, like, for example, it could be a cervical polyp which is causing this bleeding, like, for example, there could be some uh, vaginitis, some cervicitis, which is probably causing this bleeding, then, you know, you can figure it out on a per speculum examination. So let us see what we found in our case. We found that she wasn't particularly pale. Uh, her pulse rate is settled 88 per minute. Her BP is fine. Her abdomen is soft. On per speculum examination, we did see some mild bleeding and on per vaginal examination, we found out that the os was open, bulging membranes were felt at the os, the uterus was enlarged to about 10 weeks in size, the uterus itself is non-tender, the bilateral furnaces are also free, I mean there's no adnexal mass and they are non-tender. Now what I am trying to emphasize here, do not skip the examination part and do not be too eager, you know, to send of the woman for an ultrasound because I mean all of these findings by themselves by itself has made your diagnosis pretty certain so what is your diagnosis at the end of it now so the uterus being enlarged it is obviously an intrauterine pregnancy that's why the uterus is enlarged okay and the os is open some bulging membranes are felt at the os so the contents are still inside 
right? They have not been yet expelled. I mean, the uh, the small embryo is still inside, the sac is still inside, and you're seeing the bulging membranes of the sac. And it's not an ectopic pregnancy because in an ectopic pregnancy, what will happen? The uterus would be normal in size or maybe slightly bulky, and the focus of your findings would be at the adnexa, could be an adnexal mass, for initial tenderness, maybe some cervical motion tenderness. So at the end of this examination, what is your diagnosis? So, your diagnosis at the end of this examination is abortion. And let's dig a little deeper. What kind of clinical presentation of abortion it is? You see here that her period of gestation was 10 weeks. The size of the uterus corresponds to 10 week size, right? The bleeding is mild. She is hemodynamically stable. So what I can judge from this clinical situation is that the contents, the entire contents of the uh, you know, products of conception, they are still inside. However, the os has started to open up. Right. That means the process of abortion has gone to an extent that it cannot be turned back on itself. It is inevitable. So this becomes an inevitable abortion. I mean, there's no stopping this now. Right. Now, let's move on further. And talk about. the various kinds of clinical presentations of abortion. Now, this diagram will help you understand what I was trying to tell you in the previous slide. So, let's have a look at this figure here, right? I mean, the contents are still inside, right? These uh, gestational sac has separated from its attachment, right? So, behind the chorion, you can see this bleeding and that is trickling down from the os and from the vagina. We can see that the os is open, the membranes are bulging which we felt on our PV examination and the contents are all inside. So size of the uterus corresponds to the period of gestation, the os is open, there is bleeding, there is some pain, right? And this is definitely your inevitable abortion. I mean, if we have, you know, uh, doubts about our clinical examination findings, we can always do an ultrasound to confirm our diagnosis. So you can do an ultrasound here, plus minus, I would write it. Why am I writing plus minus? Because it doesn't necessarily change your line of management. I mean, if your clinical findings are certain, then your line of management doesn't necessarily change by doing an ultrasound. However, if you doubt about your findings, you can definitely confirm them on an ultrasound. Now, let's have a look at the other two types also that I want to show it to you here. So, have a look at this figure here on the left, the extreme left. So, the contents are still all inside. So, the size of the uterus here corresponds to the period of gestation, right? But note that the os is closed. So, the process of expulsion has not yet started. However, there is some bleeding. So, bleeding could be minimal, right? Could be spotting, just spotting. Pain may or may not be there, right? Pain could be plus, minus, right? But the characteristic important feature to note here is that the process of expulsion has not yet started. So, right now, there is just a threat of abortion. So, this is what we call as threatened abortion and to confirm, we definitely have to do an ultrasound. You definitely have to do a pelvic ultrasound on which you will see that the embryo is still inside and the cardiac activity would be present. Then you would call it as a threatened abortion, right? Now, if you have Looking at the, if you have to look at the figure on the extreme right here. Now, what has happened? Contents have been expelled, right? So, during the process of expulsion, what has happened? Part of the contents have already been expelled. That's why the size of the uterus would be less than the period of gestation. 
it is on the way of expulsion that's why your os is still open right your os might be closed your os might be closed but then there would also be evidence of retained products of conception i would like to uh, write them as short form rpocs retained products of conception would be seen on ultrasound okay so there can be there can be two possibilities that is that the size of the uterus is less your os is still open you might be able to feel the products of conception in your hands while doing a pervaginal examination that's a very clear cut diagnosis of an incomplete abortion part of the products expelled part still retained inside this is what we call as an incomplete abortion there could be a second clinical profile to this a woman could have come with the complaint of amenorrhea urine pregnancy test positive bleeding per vaginum part of the products have been expelled the os has managed to close but some products are still retained inside i mean that diagnosis you can make by checking on ultrasound so if the ultrasound shows with evidence of retained products it's still an incomplete abortion so this is another differential diagnosis that we need to consider of course if the uh, you know the process of the abortion is incomplete obviously she would present with much more amount of bleeding much more amount of abdominal pain and depending upon how much blood she has already lost be it an inevitable or an incomplete abortion depending upon how much amount she of blood she has already lost she might just be in shock right she might have tachycardia she might have low bp so that is what we are going to see and finally the other kind of clinical situation is what we call as the complete abortion now sometimes what can happen is you know a woman had a pregnancy early first trimester then she had an episode of bleeding she bled a lot you know during the first two or three hours by the time she happened to reach the hospital her pain has subsided her bleeding has now stopped you ask her still i mean is there a history of passage of any fleshy mass of products it could be there it might not be there because sometimes what happens you know women pass those products in the toilet itself so she might give you this history and then of course you start thinking in terms of maybe it is a complete abortion right so when it is a complete abortion the uterus has decreased in size because all the products have already been expelled your os is closed right your bleeding and pain and everything the symptoms have subsided and there is obviously a history of preceding symptoms like that and you will definitely do an ultrasound to confirm because on your ultrasound you will find that the uterus is empty and then you would label it as a complete abortion okay so now let us see how do we proceed from here on okay so what we have diagnosed we have diagnosed and a case of inevitable abortion our particular patient's vitals were stable so far we ourselves have not done an ultrasound because what we felt the clinical findings were pretty certain that it is a case of inevitable abortion at 10 weeks of gestation so how are you going to proceed so you're going to secure an iv line first of all right i mean she is right now not bleeding maybe not bleeding excessively right now her vitals are stable but she could worsen at any point in time on the go so you need to secure an iv line you need to keep your resuscitation ready of course your resuscitation will take precedence in case your patient is already showing features of shock if she's having tachycardia visibly a lot of bleeding is happening you know and she's having a lot of pain and everything so you are going to resuscitate her much sooner catheterize the bladder if she's already in shock keep blood ready keep it arranged i mean it should not be like you know you've left it on that and then at a later point in time you would require blood and then you are sending requisition for blood so keep it ready because a woman who presents with abortion can at any point in time worsen her bleeding might increase and then she might need a blood transfusion and more so of course you know if she is looking excessively pale she's already lost a lot of amount of blood if she's already anemic you know then of course like you know an hb of less than 7 if she's severely anemic hb of less than 7 gram per deciliter you want to keep blood in hand ready and do send for urgent blood investigations i mean we would want to send for the um 
hemoglobin at least a complete blood count is much better of course but yes we need a hemoglobin we need a blood grouping rh typing and send the blood for cross match right and these are the two most important investigations other than this you can obviously check for a random blood sugar checking for sugar is also important in particular scenarios where you're suspecting a uh, diabetes mellitus like that so checking for rbs you need to do so send for these urgent blood investigations if a patient is already in shock you, would go, you are going to send the entire uh, profile i mean then you're going to send the baseline uh, renal function tests as well right so depending upon your clinical scenario you are going to send for these urgent blood investigations and also you are going to give her a perineal pad at the offset so if you are the person on call in the emergency do these basic procedures give her a perineal pad so that you can assess how many pads she is soaking during the period of observation and what is the amount of bleeding that is happening after this yes of course your further management depends upon what type of abortion it is we started with a clinical profile where we had a number of differential diagnosis so all your treatment is going to depend upon your final diagnosis right so let us just summarize here in the end eventually that if you have a woman in the reproductive age group and she has come with the complaint of any abnormal bleeding i mean it could be bleeding followed by a period of amenorrhea it could be bleeding excessive in amount bleeding which is uh, excessive in duration or any pattern of abnormal bleeding do a urine pregnancy test first rule out pregnancy related issues go for a careful history and examination pertaining to the list of differential diagnosis that we did your history and examination could clearly give you an idea about maybe a gynecological cause maybe a trauma right a traumatic cause right and yes of course in these situations your urine pregnancy test would be negative right these causes could also be coincidental with pregnancy so do ask about them in history as well and other than that you could have an abortion you could have an ectopic or you could have a molar pregnancy right now in your abortion your uterus is going to be enlarged on your examination findings pain is not the predominant complaint it is bleeding which happens usually first followed by pain in the lower abdomen in case it's an ectopic it's pain usually followed by may be bleeding which is usually minimal in amount and your uterus is going to be either of normal size or maybe slightly bulky and your findings would be in the adnexa so your bilateral you know your fornices not bilateral on either side your fornices could be tender could be showing an adnexal mass right and in case of a molar pregnancy again bleeding becomes the complaint bleeding away from the vagina the uterus is enlarged quite a bit so somebody who's having bleeding in the uh, first trimester the uterus might be enlarged to you know uh, 14 week size 16 week size even 20 week size but it could be of the same size it could be of the same size may even be smaller but yes usually it is enlarged right and if it's particularly enlarged that you can feel it from the per abdomen examination you will not be able to palpate for the fetal parts so there is going to be inability to palpate the fetal parts right so broadly this is how you are going to approach a reproductive age group woman with abnormal bleeding you're going to focus on the various differential diagnosis and 
you can eliminate these by doing a careful history clinical examination and then go for an ultrasound because you need to know what you are expecting to find in an ultrasound based on your clinical findings so i hope this uh, video helped you in figuring out this important relevant topic and on subsequent sessions we'll be talking about each of these topics independently as well so thank you so much for listening